Welcome to today's episode of the Working Wisdom Podcast Series, brought to you by the C.T. Bauer College of Business at the University of Houston. We're having a conversation about work-life balance, how to navigate and overcome challenges within your career, and how to make business more accommodating to a diverse workforce. Hi, I'm Kelly McCormick. I am the director of Red Labs, the University of Houston's tech startup accelerator, and I'm teaching a new class in the fall for women in entrepreneurship. And our guest today is Grace Rodriguez. Uh, Grace is a founding member of Station Houston, which is a tech and innovation hub in the Houston area. She is a member of many different boards and um, serves on different in several different positions that contribute to Houston's larger entrepreneurial ecosystem. And uh, she is here with us today to tell us how she does it. <laughs> so Grace, <laughs> I'm just going to throw it to you and let you tell you a little bit more about yourself and uh, what you're doing right now and how you're balancing all of that. Hi, Kelly. Thank you so much for having me on this podcast. Um, again, I'm Grace Rodriguez, co-founder and chief experience officer for Station Houston. And how I got involved in Station Houston, it's a long and winding path. Um, I moved back to Houston in 2000 and started working with um, a group of DJs, actually, um, who had asked me to manage them. And through working with them, I got into the nightlife scene during the first um, revitalization of downtown. And I was recruited to become the editor for a startup magazine at the time called Rice Addict. It was for the Asian American community. And from my work with with Rice Addict, um, I was noticed by the... um, Organization of Chinese Americans, which is a Pan-Asian advocacy group, was recruited to be on their board. And from my activity with them, was recruited to be um, community liaison for Gordon Kwan when he was at city council and mayor pro tem. And I got exposed to a lot more of what Houston has to offer. So I became really passionate about Houston community through my work at city council. Um, When he was term limited out of office, I I joined the boards of a number of different organizations, um, I worked with the Asian Pacific American Heritage Association, um, worked with the Asian Chamber of Commerce, with uh, a, ver- a variety of other uh, chambers of commerce, the Philippine American Chamber of Commerce, and um, started with consulting. So I consulted political candidates. I consulted startup companies. I start, uh, consulted m- small, mid-sized um, growing businesses, and um, just really became passionate about helping people launch and grow their businesses. I'm specifically ideating. I loved ideating. So my background is neuroscience and design. Um, I went to Columbia pre-med and was doing cognitive neuroscience research and then transferred to Parsons for design and found that marketing was a really good marriage of both of those two things. So if you understand people's motivations, if you can understand the psychology behind people's behaviors, you can design better for them. So when I started my consulting practice, I was Doing, um, doing a bit of that, like trying to figure out what are the problems that people are facing, what are some potential solutions for that. And that was a really good fit for the, the growing tech startup community. Um, when Twitter first launched, I think t- 2007, six or seven, um, I feel like that was one of the, the pivot points for Houston's startup community because it's Houston's such a big city. It's sprawling. You know, um, it's very hard for people to bump into each other and meet each other. And so, um, Twitter was one way that people could find each other um, and start aggregating around similar passions, aggregating around ideas. Um, I got the I, I got the feeling. Uh, I better understood that in order to create more change locally, you know, in Houston. And we need to bring some of that idea. We need to create another safe space for people to share their ideas and not be afraid to fail, um, be able to be vulnerable, as Brene Brown has said, um, and not be ridiculed. Because I think that's one of the biggest challenges that people face, and especially women entrepreneurs face, is this idea that, well, if I fail, will people make fun of me? Will they think less of me? You know, will they not respect me anymore? Um, so if we, if we created a place where it was safe to do that and safe to do it openly, and then people would were happy to share what their failures were. I mean, I think that was one of the most enlightening and empowering experiences of being part of the TED community um, was seeing a lot of people who talked about their failures um, and were not ashamed of them. You know, they were actually really proud, and they would talk about 
um, how what they learn from them. And really, that's where learn, you know, learning comes from is making a mistake because you've tried something. It means you've tried something and you've examined it, and then you've learned. And hopefully, you'll you'll uh, apply that learning to the next thing, the next idea. So, um, as Ted was winding down the act of the TED Active Conference, um, Blair, I got an email from Blair, and he said he met Emily Keaton. And so Emily was originally from Houston. She was she had been working in New York, and she's coming back. And she was really interested in this idea of creating a, a new space where um, tech startups and mentors and investors and um, corporate innovators could could meet. You know, could something similar to 1876. I'm sorry, 1871 in Chicago, 1776 in DC, Capital Factory in Austin. All of these, you know, great tech hubs um, or accelerators. And so I met with Emily. Um, we we start talking. We uh, went to branding and marketing meetings, and she um, she met Jr. John Rayali, who um, is the other co-founder, another co-founder and the chief uh, executive officer, CEO of uh, of Station. And when she um, when she found him, and he had decided not to launch his his venture fund because that's what he was actually planning on doing. You know, he he basically signed up to be the engine. You know, to to drive Station forward. And I said, well, awesome, I want to do programs because I'm really passionate about creating these really um, educational, engaging, interactive, and fun experiences that bring people together. So, so JR and I met and we you know, said, okay, I'll do, I'm, I'm passionate about this, you're passionate about that, let's work together and make this something really awesome. And, um, and then we launched, March 2016. And within a month, we were at capacity, which was very telling because a lot of you know, people in Houston had said, where is the tech talent? There is no tech talent in Houston. Um, w- will there be enough startups? And um, w- w- doesn't HTC, the Houston Technology Center, already serve this? Um, but us hitting capacity within about a month was proof that there is room to grow. There is a lot of talent here. There are a lot of startups here. Um, they just didn't have a place to go to and meet each other. And they didn't have a place to go for other people to find them. So that's how we carved out the space for a station. And then we've evolved into more of a startup hub. Um, we didn't initially want to be an accelerator, so we didn't do the cohort-driven thing. Um, we wanted to be a place where people could, could meet and connect. And so that's ongoing. Um, we wanted to make sure that they have access to mentors because a lot of the, these um, entrepreneurs are tech startup community is is not as mature as it is on the West Coast or the East Coast. So <clears throat> we had to make sure that there was enough education there for people to to learn how to start a startup, whether they should leave their jobs and start a startup. I mean, I think one of the advantages of station launching when it did, and this is going to sound really strange, but it's it launched during a time of some of the most massive layoffs in energy and healthcare. And with the downturn of of oil, of oil and gas, um, it's actually opened up entrepreneurship as an option for a lot of people who never would have considered it. Um, and we found a lot of people who've come to come through Station and then gone on to TMCX or gone to HTC, having been having come from a layoff basically and transforming into an entrepreneur and launching their own business um, and creating more jobs. You know, so it's it's been it's been an interesting um, it's definitely been an interesting journey. <laughs> that does sound like an interesting journey. Um, and honestly, uh, a number of more things that I want to ask you about just based on that story. Uh, but one of the important things um, I think that I wanted to touch on, uh, you mentioned this this progress that's happening in the Houston startup community, and it, it definitely has grown a lot. And I've only been here for about three years, but I've seen how much it's matured. But I know that there's also a lot of space to grow. There's so much potential in this community. And so I'm wondering, what do you think is the most important thing for us to do or for us to contribute or for individuals that are interested in pursuing entrepreneurship or helping the entrepreneurial community to do in order to help the growth of the Houston startup community? Well, I think that word you use, contribute, is is really critical. Uh, there are a lot of people who who observe, who watch on the sidelines or are fans. You know, they, they think it's really great. Um, and it's it's good to have people who are supportive, but it would be better to have people who are contributive, right? Who are participative, who are actually um, showing up and saying, you know what? Do you need help moving chairs? I mean, small things really help um, in the aggregate. So, um, for instance, the work that you that the University of Houston 
and Red Labs is doing with Rice University and Ellspark and getting students to meet each other, right? That wouldn't have, that didn't happen before. But both sides, both universities are showing up and saying, you know what, we need to work together because this is better for the future of Houston as getting these students to start interacting because you'll never know where a good idea comes from or a good team, how a good team is formed. It's not necessarily from the same um, community that can be insular at a university. It's, it's just connecting. So showing up to events, showing up to programs, and seeing how you can contribute. Contributing could be volunteering. It could be helping out with an event as you learn the community and um, contributing your expertise. If you have some insight about something, uh, about an, um, marketing or design or um, operations or um, product development, we would love more people to be talking about these things and teaching about these things um, or mentoring You know, entrepreneurs who need that kind of that kind of uh, expertise in education. Another thing that came up, I was at um, I was at Circular Summit earlier this year, and for those who aren't familiar, Cir- it was Circular Summit was founded by Circular Board. Um, the co-founders of that, Elizabeth Gore and Carolyn Rods, um, started Circular Board because they wanted to launch um, an accelerator for women entrepreneurs. And so at this event, uh, one woman stood up and said, "You know, the best way to help other women entrepreneurs is with contracts." give them contracts. And so I think that's one of the most important ways that people can contribute to the success of the startup community is find out how can you give business to a startup, to a local startup, right? It's kind of like buy local. Well, it's the same same kind of concept is, is buy local or be a client of local, you know, and for corporate investors or um, or for corporations, looking for local companies to provide the services that you need because it's not... It, it kind of pains me when I was working with um, um, Culture Pilot and know, knowing a lot of local design agencies, there's so much talent here. But for some reason, a lot of the work would go to New York or Chicago. Um, and I don't know if it's because people, the perception was that they were better there or the perception was that there isn't any here. But there is a lot of great talent here. Um, we just need a way of sourcing it. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm also interested in the idea of starting up as an entrepreneur because I know that sometimes the most difficult step is just deciding you want to do it and taking that that leap of faith and I think that it's especially difficult for women sometimes and you mentioned that sometimes it's contributed to or based on their um, unwillingness to fail at things or being afraid of failing and what would you say to the people that are thinking about being entrepreneurs and specifically women um, that have that fear or they're just interested but want to learn more? I meet a lot of people who have, who believe they have a great idea, you know, and I can't say whether it's a great idea or not, but I'm going to say that they, they feel like they have a, feel strongly that they have a great idea and they, they think that, you know what, I, I wish somebody would do this. The biggest challenge of getting people to become an entrepreneur is thinking I'm the one to do this. Um, if, especially if you see a solution to a problem that, um, and that people would pay you for that solution. I think that's part of the mental exercise after you've made the decision. But making the decision, it's really just a mental block. Um, for a lot of people, they feel like, well, I can't give up the security. You could get laid off tomorrow. There really is no not not much job security um, these days. Um, people say that, well, you know, it's it's not for me, and if it's not for you, then that's fine, you know. Um, but I think for people who have thought about it or considered it or think um, or think they have a solution to a problem. Um, I think it's just, it, it's this um, taking the perspective of it's an experiment, right? So I think one of the reasons why my my career path has been very circuitous is that I've, I just see my life as an experiment, right? I'm going to try something today, and if it works, I'm going to stick with it. And if I find that it's really not the right thing for me, the right fit for me, then I'm going to see what is. So would you rather 50 years from now think, man, I wish I had done that, or I wish I had tried that, or would you rather think, you know what, I tried that, and it was really great, but I'm glad I'm here now, you know, or I tried that, and it's been awesome, and, I'm, you know, it's gotten me to this point. I love that. I actually wrote down, look at life as an experiment, just as a note to myself. <laughs> but uh, we're going to take a short break to hear an important message. When we return, we'll continue our conversation with Grace Rodriguez on how did she do it. Got an idea for a startup? Red Labs is the University of Houston's co-working space, startup accelerator, and technology entrepreneurship program. Supported by Bowers Wolf Center for Entrepreneurship, we work with UH-affiliated founders to turn your technology startup ideas into high-growth ventures. 
We provide free co-working space, access to mentors and resources in the startup community, and customized startup curriculum. For more information, visit redlabs.bower.uh.edu. We've been talking a little bit about getting involved with the Houston startup community and growing the Houston startup community. Uh, and because we're trying to focus on getting more women involved in the Houston startup community or in startups in general, what do you think are some ways that people can be more inclusive in the community to allow more women to get involved or encourage more women to get involved? That's a really good question. Um, there has been a lot of talk, especially with the recent um, manifesto that happened at Google. One of the engineers wrote um, why he thinks that there aren't many as many women um, in technology, and he said that it's because they're less suited to it. Um, but if you go back, and also if you look at some of the people who responded to that comment, to that manifesto, um, coding was founded by women, right? And it was just somehow that they... Um, started to get edged out of technology, right? So if you look at Ada Lovelace and developing the punch cards for for looms, um, women were included in the early days of coding. Um, Grace Hopper, for instance, I don't know if you've ever heard the Grace Hopper conference, but Grace Hopper um, was a Navy admiral, and she um, actually coined the word bug because there was an actual physical bug in the computer that made it fail. So I think that it's... The, pr- the problem is at some point um, we, we um, as a tech community, started falling into the, um, the dangerous stereotype that men are more uh, engineering, like wired for engineering, wired for technical skill, and women are more, I guess, fo- uh, better at soft skills. And we see tech as... Um, a hard skill as an engineering kind of uh, focus skill and marketing is like, so marketing and PR, great. Women are great for that. Let's hire women for marketing and PR. When it comes to tech, we need more guys because guys are wired, they're better wired for this, which is completely false. Um, and women all, also fall prey to this as well. Um, it, I've seen t-shirts where for girls, um, for women that say, I hate math. And that's kind of ridiculous. I loved math when I was growing up. Actually, when I was in fourth grade, fourth through sixth grade, I wanted to be a nuclear physicist because my dad told me that's the career that uses a lot of math. But at some point, um, I heard so much that, well, girls aren't that great at math. I, I actually, I didn't think that, I didn't consciously believe it. I didn't say that I'm, I suck at math. But at some point, I stopped focusing on it. So it's not that we're telling, we're not teaching girls to tell themselves that they're bad at math. We're teaching girls that, um, maybe something else is better for you. Um, so um, as they grow up um, and, and go into and pick the fields that they want to go into, I think um, women are encouraged to go towards these soft skills or towards skills that are more people, you know, person-to-person oriented versus um, development or, te- or like how we think of hard technology um, oriented um, so I think it's up, it's upon us who are in it now to start inviting more women in. I've seen a couple of times, unfortunately, where women who have great ideas are told, you need to find a co-founder. Um, or you, instead of telling them that, you know what, you can hire developers to build this for you. Or you take a, a basic coding class so you understand it. Or here's some ways that you can prototype it. Instead of teaching them how to do it themselves or how to hire people, we automatically tell them, you need to find somebody else who will be a co-founder. And that's finding a co-founder is not a bad thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing at all. Um, but I'm saying that we're, we're telling, we're, or we're subconsciously telling women is that um, you are not the person that's qualified to lead this company because um, you don't have the technical skills. And I say that because I've met many women who were told that they need to find a technical co-founder um, when all they really needed to find was a good developer that they could hire to build something for them. That's great. Um, I love the idea of saying if you have a growth mindset, we can basically get you there. I say that all the time with people who are thinking about entrepreneurship. And there is a lot of misconceptions, both for women and men, that believe that there's a certain kind of personality you need or you need to have certain skills in order to be an entrepreneur. And I always tell them, if you want to be an entrepreneur, all you need to do, all you need to be willing to do is learn. And Mm -hmm. so I think that's really important. I, we, we talked about what people can do as a community to be more inclusive. And I think that sometimes 
these things have been said so often throughout a woman's life. You know, mm-hmm. you said it started when you were kind of young. You, And that's not rare. That happens all the time that women are discouraged from going towards science and math and instead pointed toward disciplines that are thought to be more female disciplines, like English. Um, so if you've been going through that for a while, what would you say, is there anything you could do personally to build up your own confidence? Things that you could, actionable ways that you could start being more confident in those areas. Mm-hmm. I think it's important to include everyone in that discussion and to have everyone be aware of the language they're using. Yeah. Um, confidence is just, it's a result of of practice and habit, right? So if in the same way that you think of it's it's daunting to become an entrepreneur, for a woman, it's, it's even more daunting to become an entrepreneur, I think, because, um, because we are uh, given the impression that we are in not as um, as strong as leaders, right? The the prototype for a leader in America is this visionary, maverick, you know, kind of masculine person that's get, that's charging forward, um, and uh, a lot of times women aren't be seen as that, right? For women to get the same kind of confidence, and basically, I, I think I find I meet a lot of women who have who have developed a quiet confidence. So it's not that you have to be extroverted; you don't have to be. Um, this outspoken, visionary, bulldog kind of personality. Um, you just have to practice like talk, um, owning your own space, being comfortable in your own skin, um, talking about yourself. And I think it goes back to the idea of experiment, right? So whatever you try is an experiment. The world is not going to crash. You know, um, nothing tragic is going to happen or traumatic is going to happen if you say, you know what, I tried that and I failed. The next thing I want to bring up is related to entrepreneurship and to this idea of what your of your path in life, because um, especially I think a lot of people have this idea that they have to do these things in the right order, and this is just like, it's set, you know, this is what you do. Um, and in some ways, I think that that's because they're not even thinking about these other creative options. And so I'm very interested in what are ways to inspire creativity and to create more opportunities for creativity. Because I know that you have a background in creativity. And I especially am interested in, you know, inspiring creativity in women and trying to get them to understand, connect with their own creativity. Because there's also this belief that you're creative or you're not. Mm -hmm. And I think we both know that's not really true. The more you work at it, the more creative you can become. And nobody is just, some people are certainly more creative than others. But everyone's creative in their own way. So I just, I'm, I'm curious about what can be done to help people get more creative. It's, um, it bring, that question brings to mind this great quote from Pablo Picasso. I'm going to butcher it, so I'm just going to paraphrase. Um, but it's to the, to the effect that we are born creative and it's beaten out of us as we get older. And uh, it's very true. I, everybody's creative. It's just that we are we are raised to think that being creative means uh, painting a, you know, a, creating a work of art or creating music or writing a book. Um, being creative is really, it's just, it's thinking of something new or thinking of connecting two different ideas to create something new. Um, creativity is really the breeding ground for innovation, right? So to be creative... Um, there's there's no one thing and no one path, and um, you don't you're not born with it or you're not. Um, everybody has that opportunity to have a new idea or connect two ideas into something new. Changing the lens, changing the frame for what we think of as creative, right? It's not what's on a canvas in a frame that's creative. It is like it is everything that you're doing to repurpose something, bring new life, or create something new. Um, turn a blank page into a full page, right? It's, there's so many things that you can do that's creative. With all that you've done and all you're doing now, how do you balance all of those things? It's That's a really interesting question because uh, I have this conversation with a, a lot of women, especially um, with Carolyn um, for Circu- from Circular Board. The idea of work-life balance is a fallacy. And I find that it's really interesting that it's often asked of women, how do you balance work and life as if we are supposed to um, chunk these two things up and, and then figure out which one we want to focus more on or how do we um, how do we separate these two or how do we deal with them separately? And the reality is, how do, the question should be, um, how are you building the life that you want? And then how do you 
integrate work into it, right? Because maybe work is really a, a large part of your life and it's because it's integrated into your life. If you're really passionate about design, for instance, or if you're really passionate about um, fashion and part of your work is going to trade shows or going to conferences or um, going shopping or, you know, like doing all of these other things that seem fun, that's not work. That's just, you know, part of your life and it also happens to help you do what you do to get to create revenue or to get paid. Um, so I think that when people ask that of women, um, women should just not even um, dignify the question um, and instead say, you know what, I have a very fulfilling family life and it's really wonderful that um, my significant other uh, helps me with it or understands and helps me um, take care of the kids when uh, I need some more time to, to be working on the one thing um, and then other times I spend more time with the kids and they help me uh, with the work side of things, you know, or I have a great team that helps me do X, Y, and Z. I mean, basically it's, um, I find it really interesting that not many people ask that of men, ask the same question of men. Again, going back to the idea that we don't use the same language for women that we do for men. If I were to say like, how do I, how am I creating the life that I want and how do I integrate work into it? It's, I make sure that I make time for for mind space, you know, a lot and a lot of us don't uh, actually take time for self care, and self care includes it whether if it's um, exercise that really helps you be present, then exercise. If it's meditation, if it's just going out with your friends and having a glass of wine at the end, you know, on a weekend or in the middle of the day, then do that. You know, um, do whatever it, you need to make sure that you rejuvenate, that you have some me time. Um, for you because it's so important for mental health and your mental health means, you know, plays into your physical health. And if you, either of those are out of whack, you're not going to be able to be very productive or efficient or effective at what you want to do anyway. So making sure first that you are creating, you're creating the life that you want. As long as you think of that in that way, what is the life that I'm sculpting? Then it becomes this work of art. That's an experiment that you can shape and it can change um, as time goes on. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Working Wisdom podcast series from the C.T. Bauer College of Business, brought to you by the Working Families Initiative. The initiative aims to provide support and access for women in business school and the workforce and to generate research that organizations can use to implement policies and standards to benefit a diverse workforce. For more information about Bauer College and this podcast series, visit www.bauer.uh.edu slash podcasts.